The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Um, I'm Galia Golan. I'm a retired professor from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Academically, my field was basically Soviet foreign policy. But as a uh, peace activist and a women's feminist activist, I created Israel's first program in women's studies at the Hebrew University. And uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, I sort of combined my peace activism with academics and I started working on conflict resolution. And my last books have been on the Arab-Israeli conflict. The book deals with negotiations uh, since 1967 with the Palestinians, the Egyptians, the Syrians. What I was trying to do, and the whole reason that I did it was to see if I could uh, find out what factors made the difference, either way, for breakthroughs or successes. It was basically in terms of th uh, theory, I was looking at intractable conflicts, and ours is definitely an intractable conflict. It's been going on for a long time. And the question is really, how do you change a conflict like that? And so I looked at the breakthroughs and the failures, and I looked at or tried to understand just what the factors were that made for a breakthrough or what factors were missing that led to the failure and so forth. So that was what I was trying to do. I worked on it for about three years, doing a lot of historic research, which is something I'd never done before, going into archives and so on, and uh, it was very depressing. First of all, I know many of them, and I interviewed quite a few of them. Um, I interviewed some who were quite senior, and certainly a, a number who were involved. But of course, as you know, interviews are, are good. They're certainly helpful, and occasionally you learn something, but you have to be very careful with them. Same way that there are a lot of uh, first-hand books that have been written, particularly on Camp David II the, uh, in, of the year 2000. Uh, almost all the participants wrote, whether they're American or Israeli, um, only one or two Palestinians. But, uh, but each is giving his or her own, well, it's mainly his view because there weren't any women involved. Uh, but each is giving his view and to some degree is trying to defend his position or the outcome, what mistakes they didn't make and so forth. So everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. The only thing that's 100% reliable are the archives. And that was amazing to me to see documents protocols, minutes of cabinet sessions, Israeli cabinet sessions, June 1967, right after the war. And then interestingly, to go to the American archives and to see what the Israelis or the Jordanians or the Egyptians were saying to the Americans. It was fascinating. And those are things that, they're not the whole picture of course, but they can, they can give you a very accurate picture, at least of what was going on. In other words, that's the, those are the minutes of a meeting. And now maybe people say, oh, well, the archives can be doctored, but I, I think we have to be careful about going too far in terms of skepticism. The, the archives are, are really quite good. They're online. It, it's absolutely extraordinary. I sat here in my, in my study in Ranana. I read a thousand pages of archives, conversations, uh, and, and they're, it, it's extraordinary. I also was in the LBJ library in uh, Texas and I went to those archives, but that wasn't necessary. That was just for the fun of it. But it's all there. What was interesting there is that you had things like letters that LBJ wrote or 
maybe his notes on a, on a communique or on a report. So that's very interesting, but what I was really after uh, was pretty much available up to the mid-1980s. Not everything is in either archive, the US or the American. In other words, not everything is available, it's there. Not everything is available. Uh, the archivists here, the, ar the, the National Archive is very helpful, yeah. and they were very helpful to me as I was looking for material. I, I found, for, first of all, the discussions on the 18th and 19th of June. Now, I knew about them somewhat because they'd been written about, but to see there, frankly, what I saw there, and then I understood a lot of what happened afterwards, was that basically, the Israeli leaders, certainly at that time, probably before, and I'm talking about Eshkol and Golda Meir and, uh, and Nigal Alon and so forth, and the leaders afterwards, up to perhaps Ehud Olmert, were absolutely convinced that the Arabs would never make peace with us. And so in opening the cabinet meeting, which is the first cabinet meeting after the war in June 1967, where they have to discuss what, inf what they're going to tell Abba Iban to say at the United Nations and the General Assembly, which was about to take place. That was their, basically their mandate or their topic. And the whole, the whole basis, the assumption, as they said, is, well, we know the Arabs will never make peace with us, but we have to be able to say something. And then they were discussing, should we say what our conditions for peace are, and since they're not going to make peace, and Diane actually said, we shouldn't just make this a bluff and say what the conditions are, even though we know it's not possible. Maybe we ought to think about this. But in any case, what's important there is that they did decide to give back the Sinai, but to keep Gaza, and uh, to annex it, but before annexing it, uh, move the refugees maybe to the West Bank, and to give back the Golan Heights to the international border. Those were things that were decided then. Begin was in the government at the time. It was a national unity government. He agreed to those because in his eyes, except for Gaza, this was not Eretz Israel. On the West Bank, they decided not to decide, except that the Jordan River would be our border. The Jordan Rift Valley had to be in our hands, and of course, East Jerusalem. Those are the decisions. As for what would be in the middle of the West Bank, they couldn't decide whether to return it to Jordan or to have a Palestinian state. And in the months after that, they even talked about uh, a Palestinian state, the enclave, little enclaves, but surrounded territorially, because we would be in the Jordan Rift Valley, surrounded territorially by Israel. Now, what happened here, and I think the next shocking thing, was as they're, as they're having these discussions and decided not to make a final decision about the West Bank at this time. By the way, a year later, they went back and, and withdrew the decision about Sinai and the Golan. But while they're doing that, I discovered that on the 2nd of July, King Hussein had initiated a meeting and met with the Israelis, that was the Director General of the Foreign Ministry, Herzog, um, in London. And he wants to talk peace. Two weeks later, Abba Ivan in the American archives tells the Americans, no Arab leader will sit down with us. Meanwhile, they've been sitting in London. But what was really, never mind the lying, you do that in diplomacy. But what really upset me was this conviction that no Arab leader will make peace with us, and therefore, and this is what held out all along, the decision was, yes, we have to hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley, and in, in this, finally in the summer, in the fall of 68, we get the Alone Plan, which is just that. We'll hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley, and we can deal with Jordan on the other issues, because the Palestinians with whom they spoke in the West Bank were certainly not interested in a state that was just enclaves surrounded territorially by Israel. So they went for this Jordanian option, uh, but to hold on to certain areas, and as you probably know, and was decided, or, or at least proposed by Igal Alon at that June meeting, to start building settlements. Even though in September of 1967, they asked for a, uh, uh, an opinion from the legal advisor to the foreign minister, can we build settlements in terms of international law? And the, the, the opinion was no, it's against international law, but of course they continued building settlements. It's a labor government. But what's distressing here 
is something that returned all along, this conviction that the Arabs will never make peace with us. And therefore, we have to have security measures. Jordan Rift Valley, for example. And even if, and this is the mistrust involved, even if they make peace with us, it won't hold. And so we have to have certain areas because there might be an invasion from a third state, even if Jordan signs an agreement. This comes back over and over. It happened also with, uh, with uh, President Sadat when he made peace offers and the decision by Israel in 1971 and particularly in early 1973 was we, we have to hold on to certain security assets. In the case of Sinai, it was the passes and the uh, and Shalom Sheikh, out of a sense that peace won't hold. And so what, what I saw that really shocked me is that time and again, they forego or ignored or rejected a peace offer out of concern for security. That is, security measures rather than peace. And they never saw peace as possibly bringing the security that we needed. I understand where it's coming from. It's tremendous mistrust. It comes from centuries of persecution, the Holocaust, the works. But this, this deep belief that we'll never be accepted here, they'll never make peace with us, which by the way, Sadat understood in his speech at the Knesset, one of the things he said four times, we welcome you in the region, we accept you, you are our neighbors, because he understood this psychological aspect. Well, the truth is that King Hussein, even Assad, the father, as well as Sadat, said to negotiators, Israelis at various times, I don't understand why you need these security arrangements if we're going to have a peace agreement. There are very good reasons. There are very good reasons. Look, Jordan and Israel had an, a sort of an unwritten agreement before 1967 that Jordan would never move heavy armor into the West Bank. And they did. Now, uh, so the, Israel had plenty of reasons to be mistrustful. But what I saw is that over and over we get this. We get to... Uh, the, the, the shocking part is that we rejected peace agreement. We didn't need the Yom Kippur War. It was a peace offer. And they knew it was a peace offer because there were peace tentatives over the years. And very often, and I spoke with and am friends with some of the people who, on the Israeli side who were negotiating. And they didn't believe it was a real peace offer. offer. I, I understand that. Suspicion was very high. But the, the, this, the example that stands out, and is well known now, because it's come out in past years, the, uh, the, the thing that does stand out is that in uh, the beginning of 1973, Sadat made another peace offer. And he conveyed it to the Americans, the Americans conveyed it to Israel, and then there's a meeting in April 1973, where uh, Golda calls in her inner cabinet, and the head of the Mossad, the head of an army intelligence, and so forth, to talk about what looked like war measures, preparations for war uh, by Egypt. And they come to the conclusion that there are signs of preparations for war. And then they try to decide, should they tell the public, should they tell the cabinet, should they tell the government, or should they tell the public? And Galili says, and this is recorded and was, has been published, Galili says, okay, so what we have here is a peace offer from, uh, from Egypt with international guarantees, signs of preparations for war, and we're not going to take it because uh, we would have to give back the territories. We'd have, to re re uh, we'd have to retreat to the 1967 line. And so they decide they're gonna tell the government but not the public about the trouble, and Diane says to Galili, I suggest when you tell the, ca the government, don't say, that there's a peace offer here. Just say that there are signs of war. So there's no getting around the fact that they knew that there was a peace offer, but they had this tremendous mistrust, that's how I interpret it, which meant it's more important to hold on to Shalom Sheikh in the passes than to have a peace agreement. And so we had the Yom Kippur War. After the Yom Kippur War, things of course changed. Uh, and Begin came in, and that's a whole different story. But what what shocked me here were these opportunities to make peace. The only one who, who began to make a difference was Rabin. 
Rabin said to Kissinger in 1974 during the disengagement talks, no Arab leader will ever make genuine peace with us. But a bit later he said that could change. And he even said it might take years, changes psychology and so forth. So he allowed for the idea that while he was convinced no one would make peace with us, it could change. And what he believed is you needed a period of testing uh, and building trust, and that was how he built Oslo. As an interim agreement, a long period, relatively three to five years, in which you build up some trust, you test them. And uh, he didn't say what the agreement was going to look like, and we don't even know if he even wanted a Palestinian state. But that was the beginning, where he said, okay, until now this is how it was. Maybe it's changed. Maybe it can change. Now, Israel always said, well, the Arabs uh, never accepted our conditions. They didn't want peace. But uh, that's basically it. The, the idea that they don't want peace was based on two things. One, they never will accept us. And two, they don't accept our conditions. <laughs> so the Arabs are to blame if they don't accept our conditions. But the truth is, I don't believe that peace of any kind was really possible before 67. Now, I have a colleague. Uh, Professor Ali Pode has also written a book at the same time on missed opportunities, and he goes back to the 1950s. I don't know. I didn't research that period. For me, and for me living here and in Jerusalem, 1967 was the turning point because now we had something to give back. What could we have done before then? I don't think, I don't know if Jordan or Syria had been interested before then. And certainly the Palestinians weren't interested until 1988 when they decided to uh, abandon the need the call for all of Palestine and to go for what they called a mini-state in just the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. But for me, the turning point was 1967. We had something with which to bargain. But it was there to be bargained, and we weren't willing to bargain it. We were willing to bargain a little bit of it, maybe, or around it, or below it, or above it. So. Well, I'm not saying that the Arabs, King Hussein was knocking on our door, Sadat was knocking on our door, and much later Assad, the father, was knocking on our door. But I'm not saying that was always the case. I'm not saying that they didn't uh, misread a lot of our positions. For example, Assad really didn't understand Rabin's hesitation. Rabin was very, very suspicious of Assad, and he went very slowly in the talks with Syria. And Assad misunderstood this a lot. He thought that Rabin wasn't serious. At one point in trying to, to demonstrate to spoilers inside Israel, Rabin said, OK, I'll call for a, a, a referendum if we come to a deal. Assad was livid. He thought this, meant this was a way of torpedoing the whole thing. So it isn't that the other side doesn't exist. And it isn't that the other side was full of trust. But if I look at the, where we could have had an agreement, I find it really distressing. And it's also possible, for sure, we could have had peace with Jordan. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced right. of it. But I don't know that that would right. have made the difference, because we still got the Palestinians. So it doesn't mean it would have solved everything. The, the first thing, as I said, is this mistrust. And it doesn't matter whether it was Egypt, Syria, the Palestinians. That, that, that was almost a sine qua non. That was absolutely a given that only began to change, as I said, with, uh, with Sadat, who addressed it directly. But there was another thing about Sadat. I'm not sure that Begin necessarily trusted Egypt. Begin had a different reason for going for peace, and I really don't know what he, if he trusted or didn't trust. But for Begin, the issue was Eretz Israel, and that was the West Bank. The whole background to, to uh, the Begin-Sadat peace agreement was uh, Yes, the Yom Kippur War, which certainly made an impression, impacted on Begin, the losses, almost 2,000 Israeli soldiers lost. But also, Carter came to power, and President Carter started talking about the Palestinians and the need for Palestinian homeland, and he was pressing for reconvening of the Geneva Conference to discuss everything, including the West Bank. And in order to get that pressure off him, in other words, to get Carter off his back, so to speak. Begin, both because of the war and because of the pressure, decided to go for an agreement with either Egypt or Syria. 
because aside from Gaza, neither of those was Eretz Yisrael. I remind you of what he agreed to, Begin, in 1967. And so he initiated or tried to initiate the talks with, uh, with uh, Sadat. And in the talks, uh, from his point of view, Sinai was not Eretz Yisrael, not the land of Israel. Gaza was, and that was a big difference. And much of the reason for um, reaching an agreement was in order to hold on to the West Bank, to avoid this pressure and a, and a Geneva conference and so on. Now, it doesn't mean that Begin negotiated easily without uh, the issues over the settlements in the Sinai, the, mili the uh, airports, the military base, the oil. There were a number of issues, but basically American intervention, um, mediation, made a very big difference in some of the back-channel uh, talks that have been mentioned with, with Leon Cherney, for example, things that helped and a lot of diplomatic tricks and so on. Okay, but part of the problem, I think in Israeli negotiations, and here's where I get to uh, the Palestinians, because I look at the negotiations with the Syrians and the Egyptians much the same way. Israel was concerned about security issues, wanted assurances, real peace, genuine peace, full peace, the other side was always, it's also, as I said, suspicious. So is Israel really serious about this? One of the things, though, that runs through all the negotiations and turns out to be very important with the Palestinians is the second thing I sort of discovered in the course of this work with the archives and so on. Israeli negotiators, Israeli leaders, till this day, and it's, this includes Rabin, view the whole area to the Jordan River as ours. And they'll say it, it's ours. And Rabin said at one point, it's all ours. The only difference between us, meaning labor and the Likud, is that we're willing to give up some of it. Just recently I heard Tzipi Livni say the same thing. It's ours, of course, but, well, that to me is a, a very strange, and to the Palestinians was a very strange way to go into negotiations. There was one of the participants in the uh, Camp David talks in 2000 with the Palestinians who said, Palestinian wrote this later, if the Israelis had come to these talks with the idea or saying, look, we both have interests here, in this, these territories, we both have certain needs, certainly we both have rights, Let's see how we can come up with something that will meet some of these um, problems, demands, needs, our interests. And maybe we could have worked out something, he said. But they came with the attitude that it's all ours and we're going to be generous and give you some of it. Now, the Palestinians also considered it all theirs, but they felt that they had already given as much as they could in 1988 when they, when they gave up 78% and said, okay, a state and a 22%. But how can we start negotiating that 22% now? So it, it, in, it's true that both sides had the, the same attitude towards the territory, towards the land, but the question then is how you, how you then negotiate an agreement. And there are many other things that happened in the negotiations in terms of what each side expected from the other, but and differences in negotiating style. But basically, I think part of the problem, and maybe the major problem, was that except till we get to maybe Omert, Robin is not entirely sure, and Barak's not entirely sure, but this issue of looking for security assurances and measures instead of or letting them interfere with the idea of even having a peace agreement. In other words, raising things that are deal breakers. Robin, and I'm, one of the things that's very clear that I'm talking about is the Jordan Rift Valley. Robin talked about holding on to it. He did mention somewhere that maybe hold on to it for just 30 years. Why? We need it in case a third army wants to come across or something of that. In other words, security arrangements, which was a non-starter. It's a non-starter, it was a non-starter for Jordan, it was a non-starter for the Palestinians. You can't have the Israeli army sitting in the middle of your state, controlling all your borders, is what it amounted to. Rabin said maybe only temporary. 
Barak also, Barak started talking about 10 years. We'll hold it for just 10 years. Uh, again, though, it was this kind of thing. The same thing happened with the talks with, uh, with Syria. We've got to hold on to certain things for a certain amount of time and so on. And these things, uh, aside from the settlement building, of course, in the West Bank, sent the signal that Israel really wasn't interested. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't have worked it out, and that's exactly what Olmert did. That's what Olmert did. Olmert took that issue and the other big issue, which was Jerusalem, and found solutions to it. These military fellows with their military background thought in terms of hard security and couldn't envisage peace uh, without hard security, and they preferred the hard security over peace. Okay, that, that's entirely possible, but I think it was something else. I'm not sure that that was the only thing, and the reason I say that is that it was a military man, one of the military advisors at Camp David in 2000, who said um, it would be nice to hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley. It's not absolutely necessary. And then it was explained by Gilad Sher, who was also there, that the demand to hold on to was really more for, the, for psychological purposes with Israeli public opinion. So I'm not sure it was a purely military idea. I think the real turning point has been the perception of the greatest threat to Israel. Whether the perception of the leaders is an invasion across that line, uh, or, or the Arabs going back on their agreement, or maybe something else. And this came, I came with Rabin, and it certainly came with Omar Sipi Livni, and I think it also came with Sharon, by the way. In the book, I don't deal with Sharon so much, but in another thing I've written, I, looked, I researched Sharon. These people, Robin from the right wing of the Labour Party, and I was in the Labour Party when, <laughs> in, the, in these circles uh, at the time, Robin was in the right wing of the Labour Party. Certainly Sharon was right wing, Omer right wing, Tsipi Livni. And it was on the right wing that they began to look at the demographic issue in the 1990s. They began to see the demographic issue. So I'm speaking at the number of Arabs in the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Beginning to understand, and Rabin did, that if we continue to hold on to these territories, it was basically the Labour Party position all along. If we want to be a Jewish and democratic state, we want a Jewish majority, we can't hold on to the territories, we want to be a democratic state. The, this was always the Labour Party position. How much they were willing to give up of the land was a different question. But now on the right wing, they began to grasp this, that if we hold on to these territories, either we give them rights so that we can be a democracy, or we're going to lose our majority. Or if you prefer, we'll become a binational state or apartheid. Now, they didn't use the word apartheid, of course, but they did talk about a binational state. And my understanding of it, or at least my interpretation, is that beginning with Rabin, certainly uh, with Olmert, but also Sharon, Tsipi Livni, others, they began to view the occupation, the continuation of the occupation, the perpetuation of the occupation as a greater threat to Israel as a Jewish and democratic state than any of these other dangers. Now, there are lots of other factors. For Rabin, there were a lot of other factors that played a role, the international environment, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the Arabs needing the United States, uh, the rise of Islam, which was a bother, uh, Islamism, which was worrisome, the Iranians building a bomb, which was worrisome. There are many factors. Also, he, Rabin was concerned over how much the Israeli public could take, because uh, when the Scud attacks, for example, uh, people fled. And uh, Rabin actually said he thought the population isn't quite as steadfast uh, as uh, earlier populations here. So, I mean, there were a lot of factors. PLO was weakened by uh, the Iraq War, all kinds of things. But uh, I th there were many factors in each case, and you look at the international environment, the regional environment. But I think very basic was this under what I consider an understanding that if we hold on to these territories, where is our Zionist dream?
Barak did not offer everything and an open space. Uh, Barak offered more than had been suggested before then, definitely. He was willing to talk about Jerusalem. He, um, but he certainly didn't make an offer that a, a Palestinian leader could accept. He went further and had the talks gone on, they may well have reached an agreement because they did move. Uh, but, uh, but he talked about holding on to 10 to 12 percent of the West Bank. 10 to 12 percent of the 22 percent that the Palestinians were left with. He talked, his, his, uh, his offer on Jerusalem was a very small part of it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, 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 doc, the talks ultimately broke down over the issue of the Temple Mount. Um, now, Arafat was no angel, and I think Arafat made a serious mistake when it came to Jerusalem. He, he accepted much of what Barak said about the Jewish neighborhoods and so on, although it was a very limited offer. It wasn't what we talk about later. But uh, Arafat questioned our right to, our, our, our connection with Jerusalem. And now I go back to something that I said earlier. This issue for Israeli leaders and Israelis generally of legitimacy. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem is not just a religious or an emotional issue. Uh, there's some security elements to it as well, East Jerusalem. But it's the symbol of our legitimacy, of being in this particular place. And Arafat questioned that. He said, well, the temple was probably not even in Jerusalem. So this certainly didn't help. Did this break up the talks? Hard to say, but, I, but one thing that has to be understood, Barak, Barak made an offer that no Palestinian could accept, that, that Israel would hold on to 10 to 12% of the territories. It would hold on to the Jordan Rift Valley for at least 30, uh, 10 years. He did go down to 10 years. We'd have early warning stations. We'd have access. In other words, we would be able to send troops into that border. There were a number of things that I think could have been worked out had the talks continued. Uh, and they were intended to continue. But to think that th there was an offer there that the Palestinians could take and we could have had peace, that's not the case. It's not the case. It was a step. It definitely was, there were a lot of mistakes made there by Israel in, the, in, in, the, in terms of cultural differences, the way they treated the Palestinians, as I mentioned to you, the, it's ours, but we're going to be generous, that kind of thing. But if we look at the, 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 uh, the proposals, uh, they, they were not something you could, you could, they were nowhere near a final uh, agreement, they couldn't have an agreement. They could have conceivably be continued, but part of, part of the problem was, of course, that um, Barak in many ways publicized the failure in, the, in, in very different terms from what actually happened. He said there's no partner, and of course Clinton supported him on that for electoral reasons and so forth, but uh, Barack implied and sometimes said that the talks broke up over the right of return of the refugees, which is not the case. If anything, the final blow was the Temple Mount issue who would have sovereignty over the Temple Mount. But it wasn't the refugee issue. Now, it doesn't mean they worked out the refugee issue, but it wasn't that, and it wasn't the right of return. And the, the Palestinians were certainly interested in continuing to talk. I mean, we're talking about Palestine, which was uh, first under the Turks, then it was divided, part of it was under the Jordanians, part of it, the British had their, the, the mandate, then we, have, then we have the partition plan, when we get part of it, more than what the partition plan called for, but that was because of the invasion by the Arab states. And so the West Bank is in Jordanian hands, and that includes East Jerusalem. There was a battle there, and the, and the, and the lines were very much determined by the, the war of 1948. In 1988, after Jordan had negotiated for years, it gave, the Jordanians gave up their claim and said, it is Palestine deal with the PLO. We got Palestine, ancient Palestine, which uh, had suffered many, many invasions. Many peoples came here, the, the Hebrews and, and the Arabs and, and these and that and so forth, going all the way back. 
if we go to the 20th century, it's part of the Ottoman Empire. World War I ends, the, uh, the French and the British uh, take certain areas under their belt. The League of Nations um, gives uh, Palestine as a mandate to the British. And the British, about two years after that, in 1922, decide that the area to the east of the Jordan River they will give to the, 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 the Hashemites. And Transjordan is created. Okay? The rest of it is a British mandate from the Jordan River um, to us, west of the Jordan River. It's a mandate under the British. Come the uh, partition plan, the, meanwhile, the people living here, obviously, there were a million, uh, I think there were about a million two hundred thousand Palestinians living here, and ultimately, by the time we get to the uh, 48 war, there are about 600, 650,000 Jews. There have been Jews all along, been Palestinians all along. Partition plan says, okay, 55% of mandated Palestine, that is west of the Jordan River, will be Jewish, 45% will be Arab. The Arabs, Palestinians said, why should we give up <laughs> over, half, over half our land when in fact the Jews own only um, something like four to six percent, 4.6 or something like that, maybe 6% of the land. Why should we be giving this up? So they clearly didn't accept it. And the Jews had a dispute amongst themselves in the Zionist movement, should we do this? It's not, it's not all that we want. They decided to go for it, and they went for it. Then, as you know, there's civil war. Between November 29th, the partition plan is accepted in General Assembly. There's a civil war, that is, the Palestinians start fighting the Jews. And then when the state is declared on the 15th of May, the Arab states around us invade. As a result of the war, we virtually double the area that we got. Instead of 55%, we now got 78%. And Jordan annexes the West Bank. All again a battle, question of battle lines. There's a, there was even a, a, an exchange of territory between Israel and Jordan in the armistice agreements. So that they got the southern Hebron area, we got the area of the little triangle in the north. Don't ask me why that was done, I have no idea, but they traded a little bit of territory. Because the Jordanians invaded the Egyptians, uh, the, the Iraqi, all of them invaded because they wanted a piece of this, not because they particularly cared about the Palestinians. So the Palestinians in the course of the war, as you know, the civil war, beginning in November and up to June of 48, we had basically um, gotten rid of most of the refugees. I mean, the, 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 the whole refugee issue is, of course, tremendously open to debate and discussion and, and disagreement. What we do know is about 600 to 700,000 refugees came out of that war, mainly the Civil War, most of them up to the June. And according to the archives, most of those who left in that period up to June were the result of actions on our part, the part of the army, chasing them away, frightening them, putting them on buses, deporting them. Most of them, not all of them, a lot of them just fled. Uh, and so that's where we get our refugee problem. And many, of course, would simply move from one place inside to another place. We have what is called internal refugees, or, or, or displaced people, villages that were destroyed and so on. So this is, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about what was left here, which was about 20% of the population. Uh, the 20% of the total population that was left in this new state of Israel, who about 20% were Palestinian. And then, of course, you've got all these refugees outside. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Palestinians. And the PLO was created in 1964, mainly by the Egyptians, and, and mainly as a refugee organization. It got taken over in 1969. In 1968, Fatah, which was sitting in Syria, Fatah joined the PLO and took it over in 1969. And that's when we begin to get the, the struggle. Look, the, in my opinion, and the conclusion I came to, is that the tragedy is that this is a conflict that could have been resolved. And we came very close. 
Robin started the process towards resolution. And Omer came very close with Abu Mazen, very close, because they had dealt with all the hard issues. And they hadn't reached full agreement, but both of them have said, both of them, each of them has said that they could have done it. Now, it looks from the outside as if Omer once again made an offer and Abu Mazen turned him down. Both Omer and Abu Mazen have said that's not what happened. And the time ran out because Omer unfortunately resigned and so on and so forth. Um, and now that may be wishful thinking on my part to say, well, it could have been done. I believe it could have. I think Robin would have done it. And I think Robin would have been able to withstand the terror attacks because what, what destroyed Oslo, many things destroyed it, but one of the major things that destroyed it were the Islamic Jihad and, uh, and Hamas terror attacks. And I think Robin could have withstood withstood those as the security credentials and so forth. So I think that in that sense, Egal Amir, who murdered him, um, succeeded. Because that's where I think Oslo stopped. Uh, Paris was unable to, to, to weather those terrible terrorist attacks that took place in, in February, March 1996. And so he lost the elections and so forth. I think, I think Robin could have gotten there. I think Sharon, by the way, was on the way. I don't know how far Sharon was willing to go. He, from everything I've seen, he was willing to go pretty far, but we don't know how far. It's how much land, how many settlements he'd give up. Omer did it, in my opinion. Now, then we have to ask the question, if we had a leadership that could pick up, or was willing to pick up where Omer and Abu Mazen left off, is it possible to implement? Can we evacuate tens of thousands of settlers? In my opinion, it isn't the refugee issue and it isn't even Jerusalem that are the problems because Omar and Abu Mazen came to very close agreement on both of those, maybe even agreement. And they agreed that there'd be a NATO force under the United States on the border between Palestine and Jordan. Israel wouldn't be there. Makes sense. But you've got to, if you keep, as all the plans talk about, you keep settlement blocks that would take care of or accommodate about 80% of the settlers, what do you do about the other 20%? And the other 20% are not a few people, and they're also not your more moderate settlers who live, the ones who live close to the Green Line happen to be the more moderate ones, and they're the ones that we could annex and swap territory. Don't forget there's something out there called the Arab Peace Initiative, which is extraordinary where the entire Arab world, all 22 states, have agreed to accept Israel, normal relations with Israel, security, end of conflict, if we give up the territories. Now, it may never happen, but the point is that we have never been in a position like this. And even today, by the way, you mentioned the Arab Spring and the chaos in the region. It is, it's an amazing time in terms of the mutuality of interest between us and most of the Arab states where this is a time where <laughs> they're willing to make these, these back us up on these things. So I, I think, I really think that a, a, there are two really serious problems. One is the settlements. How are we going to move the number of settlers that would have to be moved? And the other, of course, is the rise of Islamic uh, extremism. How much, how much power does Hamas have today? It's not the majority, but is there a leadership in the Palestinian community after Abu Mazen that can make the concessions that are necessary. And these are the two big issues. We, I, I hate to think that we've missed our opportunity. We certainly had an opportunity with Abu Mazen. And as I said, the Omer Abu Mazen, if somebody had followed up on that, it could have been done because Abu Mazen had the support. And I want to say one, one thing that I think is extremely important. And it's the only thing that sort of keeps me a little bit optimistic. We all know that for years, the opinion of polls have shown the majority in Israel and the majority of Palestinians favor the two-state solution. And that doesn't change. It's been going on that way since the early 90s. Majority, clear majority. Same time, we also know clear majority on both sides believes there's no partner on the other side. The other, you can't trust the other side. The other side has no plans of leaving the occupied territories. The other side is hounded by, by extremists, terrorists. 
No partner on the other side. An interesting thing, though, is there are a series of, of surveys that have been done by academics, by Khalil Shikaki in Ramallah and a colleague of mine, Yaakov Shamir in Jerusalem, who have every four or five months polled large numbers of people, not just a couple hundred telephone calls, where they give, the, they give, they give them, the Shikaki, the Palestinians, including Gaza, and, and um, in, on the Israeli side, the Jews. And they ask them, you know, they give them the idea of a compromise on the refugee issue. Israelis will make no compromise. The Palestinians, no compromise. Jerusalem, no compromise, no compromise. But the interesting thing is that they, and this continues to happen, they give them the whole package, the very same uh, pr proposals, but in a package. And they're accepted by both peoples. The very same proposals. This was done, the uh, Institute for Strategic Studies, INSS in Israel, did the last poll. They took Khalil Shikaki and, then they, and they did the Jewish side. Same thing. And in that poll it said if the leadership in that case, Abu Mazen brings it, even more Palestinians would accept it. For all that we think that Abu Mazen is weak, they were willing to accept it. And the same thing on the Israeli side. That's why I believe that if we get a leadership that is willing to do it, it can be done. Then we have to face the issue of the settlers. We have to face the issue of the opposition on the Palestinian side, mainly the Islamists. But the majority on both sides, in my opinion, will accept that they don't want the continuation. They don't, Palestinians don't want a continuation of the occupation, that's for sure. And Israelis, I think, are finished with the conflict. We've got other things to worry about and think about. The region wants resolution because they also have other things to think about. And I think the rest of the world would like to see this. But we need the leaders who will do it.